Hello and welcome to OncLive News Network. This is Inside Oncology. I'm Laura Jones. And I'm Tara Peterson. Coming up, we're going to hear about the most important studies from the ESMO annual meeting in Madrid. In addition, we'll be talking to Dr. Mari Markman about the latest in ovarian and cervical cancer research. Later, we'll hear from researchers at the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center associated with Columbia University. In news from the ESMO annual meeting, the top story was the unprecedented findings from the Cleopatra trial in breast cancer. Dr. Sandra Swain reported the final overall survival analysis of the phase three trial, which evaluated addition of pertuzumab to trazituzumab and docetaxel, showing that the combination improved survival by almost 16 months compared with trazituzumab plus docetaxel alone in women with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. The triplet demonstrated a median overall survival of 56.5 months compared with 40.8 months with trastuzumab and docetaxel. Even more impressive is the fact that the trial allowed patients in the placebo arm to cross over to pertuzumab. Therefore, the true benefit with pertuzumab may be even larger than was observed. And other breast cancer news from ESMO. Two studies have shown promising findings for maintenance bevacizumab as a treatment for patients with HER2-negative metastatic breast cancer. In the Phase three Imelda study, maintenance bevacizumab in combination with capsidabine improved progression-free survival by 62% and overall survival by 57% when compared with bevacizumab alone. However, the study had no chemotherapy arm. Additionally, the Phase three TANYA trial showed an approximate 25% improvement and progression-free survival for patients treated beyond progression on first-line bevacizumab using bevacizumab plus chemotherapy. Survival data is expected in 2015. On the immunotherapy front, PDL1 inhibition continues to show impressive results in advanced melanoma. Results from a phase three study demonstrated that nuvolumab improved objective response rate over investigator's choice of chemotherapy from 11% to 32% in patients who had already received ipilimumab and were BRAF inhibitor if they were BRAF positive. The median time to response favored nuvolumab at 2.1 months compared with 3.5 months in the chemotherapy arm. The treatment responses were also longer lasting in the nuvolumab arm with 95% ongoing at the time of the analysis. In fact, the lead investigator, Dr. Jeffrey Weber, said he hopes this study puts an end to second and third line use of chemotherapy. Nivolumab has now achieved priority review from the FDA for melanoma. The FDA decision date is set for March 2015. Another anti pdl one monoclonal antibody, pembrolizumab, demonstrated an overall response rate of 21% in treated and untreated patients with non-small cell lung cancer. This was according to a Phase 1b study in 236 evaluable patients. In the untreated group, the overall response rate was 26%. High PDL1 expression was associated with a 48% reduction in the risk for progression and a 41% reduction in mortality risk. Another Phase 1b study of pembrolizumab showed promising activity in PDL1 expressing advanced gastric cancer and was associated with a 31% overall response rate in heavily pretreated patients. 41% of patients experienced tumor shrinkage. Adverse events were consistent with those previously reported from pembrolizumab. A phase two study exploring pembrolizumab in gastric cancer will begin in 2015. Another BRAF and MEK inhibitor combination is showing promise in melanoma. Treatment with femurafenib together with cobimetinib, which is an extremely selective allosteric inhibitor of MEK, extended progression-free survival and overall survival when compared with vemurafenib alone in BRAF-mutated patients with advanced melanoma. Vemurafenib plus cobimetinib was associated with a median progression-free survival of 9.9 .9 months compared with 6.2 months with vemurafenib plus placebo. The overall response rate was 68% in the combination arm and 45% in the placebo arm an interim analysis of overall survival showed a 35% reduction in the risk of death with the combination. 
Similar results were seen with the combination of dibrafenib and trametinib, which is FDA approved. A BRAF plus a MEK inhibitor will become a new standard of treatment for advanced BRAF mutant melanoma. Next, a phase one study published in the New England Journal of Medicine and presented at ESMO has confirmed the benefits of crizotinib in patients with ROS1 rearranged non-small cell lung cancer. In the analysis, the overall response rate with crizotinib was 72% in ROS1 positive patients because ROS1 is present only in 1% of non-small cell lung cancers and conducting large trials would be difficult. Crizotinib was already recommended by NCCN guidelines based on single patient case studies. The phase one findings could lead to an accelerated approval in this patient population. Also in lung cancer, results of the Phase 3 IMPRESS trial show that patients whose EGFR-positive non-small cell lung cancer that had developed resistance to gefitinib experienced no improvement in progression-free survival from continued gefitinib plus platinum-based chemotherapy compared with chemotherapy alone. Median progression-free survival in 265 patients was 5.4 months in each group. The study answers a key question, should EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors be continued beyond progression? Lead investigator Dr. Tony Mock said, as the result demonstrated no difference in progression-free survival, the standard treatment should be chemotherapy in this setting. In prostate cancer news, long-term follow-up of a phase three trial looking at abiraterone and prednisone demonstrated significantly improved survival compared with placebo, plus prednisone for men with previously untreated metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. After a median follow-up of more than four years and 1,088 patients, median survival with abiraterone was 34.7 months versus 30 months with placebo, translating to a 19% reduction in the risk of death with abiraterone alone. The survival results in this study are compelling, as two-thirds of men in the abiraterone arm and more than three-quarters in the placebo arm received subsequent therapy. 44% of men on placebo crossed over to abiraterone. Abiraterone was approved by the FDA for untreated metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer in December of 2012, and the FDA just recently approved enzalutamide for the same indication. A challenge for oncologists will be to determine the optimal choice and sequence of available therapies. A 62-patient study published in the New England Journal and also presented at ESMO showed that prostate cancers that were positive for the androgen receptor isoform encoded by splice variant 7, ARV7, had lower PSA response rates to abiraterone and enzalutamide than those that were ARV7 negative. If these results are confirmed, a blood test could be used to predict abiraterone and enzalutamide resistance and help guide choice of therapy. And in news from OncLive, the parent company MJH Associates has just announced the acquisition of Cure Media Group, which includes Cure Magazine, a vital resource for cancer patients and their caregivers. Cure is the largest consumer magazine in the United States focused entirely on cancer. Through the magazine's website, curetoday.com, patients can gain access to live meetings, a resource guide for the newly diagnosed, and other books and online tools. The Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center of Columbia University Medical Center and New York Presbyterian Hospital has more than 250 members, 12 core facilities, and eight research programs. In 2012, Dr. Stephen Emerson joined the center as director. This is a it is a singular, unique cancer center. First of all, by location, we are one of three comprehensive cancer centers in the state of New York, uh, one of two in New York City, and we are the only cancer center on the west side of Manhattan. The key thing about New York is that the subways go north-south. You can't really get across the island, and so we're it from Chelsea up through the west side by uh, Madison Square Garden, um, Columbus Circle, Columbia University, up to the tip of Manhattan, Westchester, and northern New Jersey. 
So we serve a, nat uh, a natural local catchment area as well as the research and uh, tertiary services we provide serve a much larger area as well. The Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center is one of the original cancer centers uh, from the National Cancer Act. It's one of only three comprehensive cancer centers in the state of New York. And uh, the great thing about uh, Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center is that it offers uh, both ther uh, therapeutic clinical trials uh, as well as standard treatments for patients who already have a cancer diagnosis and are in need of treatment. It offers survivorship uh, uh, research for patients who have uh, been cured of their disease or uh, otherwise are in remission. And it also offers all the way up at the beginning uh, treatment for uh, patients who don't have a cancer diagnosis and are undergoing screening uh, and are involved in what's called cancer prevention and control research. In their recent review, the NCI praised Dr. Emerson for his leadership, noting that his guidance helped produce exemplary results. Among cancer centers, uh, we have uh, singular programs in cancer genetics, immunology, and in stem cell biology that inform all the work and all the clinical trials we do. And so it creates a very both vibrant, uh, investigative, scientific, and community-serving cancer center. Over the last you know, five years, we've developed a very robust clinical trial portfolio at Columbia University for thoracic oncology patients, and that includes patients with all different types of lung cancer, but also esophageal cancer as well. And currently, our portfolio is the best I've, I've experienced in my you know, lifetime as a clinical investigator. So we basically have a clinical study front line, second line, third line for almost any patient uh, you know, coming with uh, different you know, forms of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. But we're also able to introduce studies for locally advanced lung cancer patients. For example, we just opened one that's focusing on EGFR inhibition in patients with stage 3 lung cancer as well as uh, uh, post-surgical adjuvant treatment studies. So I think the portfolio is very wide. Uh, we're not focusing uh, specifically on only phase one or phase two studies. We want to make sure that we have a fair balance of studies so that each patient could benefit from an important case study that could lead to advances in the field as well. And that includes uh, uh, both more conventional clinical studies, targeted agents, uh, uh, and innovative immunotherapy studies as well. The NCI recently ranked the center as outstanding for basic research, translating discoveries into treatments and a dedication to patient care. This in part comes from the Cancer Center's affiliation with Columbia University. It's a fantastic group of faculty throughout the university beyond areas we normally think of as uh, involved in cancer centers, including bioengineering, uh, synthetic chemistry, um, philosophy and ethics, economics, um, psychology. So as we think of our work in building uh, community service in designing the best new therapeutics in figuring out how to establish a cancer screening and prevention network that protects patient confidentiality and safety while providing the most decisive analytics and therapy, it's fantastic to be involved in this university. For many of those who know me in the field, I spent a decade at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, and several of us moved to start a new leukemia and malignant hematology program here. I think one of the benefits about being at Columbia, which is definitely un unique or unique from where I had come from my prior institution, was that here I can get other services that I necessarily couldn't get at a small cancer center. So if patients have other medical problems, they have heart disease, which again, most of my patients do because it's an older, the disease I deal with is an older patient population. You know, they're in their 70s. Um, they have diabetes, they have heart disease, they have other medical problems. You know, it's an advantage to be at, a, at an academic center who does other subspecialties because if I have an immediate problem, you know, I can get that, I can get them services without sending them to another institution, which is what I had to do prior. You know, if I have a patient who's got heart disease in the middle of chemotherapy and then has chest pain, I'd like to keep them here because I can manage their blood and their hematologic problems while they're on chemotherapy, but I have a cardiologist who can deal with them, take them to the cath lab. You know, so that is definitely one advantage, you know, that I didn't have prior that now I have at coming to Columbia is I have other physicians and other subspecialties who are experts in those, you know, medical problems who can handle that while I'm dealing with their leukemia. So I definitely think that's an important step up. Palliative care represents an important part of effective cancer care. 
To address this need, the Cancer Center is building an extra layer of support through its adult palliative care services. We're still in our uh, nascent phase of developing an ambulatory palliative care program. Uh, we have a developed inpatient uh, service, two inpatient teams uh, made up of an MD, nurse practitioner, social worker, and chaplain that see patients throughout the hospital in the ICUs and on their general floors. Um, in the outpatient side, we have um, an MD and nurse practitioner that are that's integrated now into the Cancer Center, um, but it's still growing. We're hoping to put this together into a larger umbrella of supportive care services here uh, in the Cancer Center, which that will hopefully benefit all the patients that come here, not just those who need palliative care, but need other services like nutrition, you know, social work services, psychology, you know, other integrative therapies that might be of benefit. Um, so that's the, that's the goal. That, I, and I'm hoping within the next few years we're going to grow this outpatient program so that all patients uh, that step foot in the Cancer Center will have access to supportive care services and be able to benefit from that. We're happy to welcome Dr. Mari Markman. Dr. Markman is president of Medicine and Science, the clinical and research unit of the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. So good to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. We'll talk a little bit about your clinical research and your background. Well, I've, um, I'm not as young as I look. I've uh, been involved in the area of uh, cancer research, cancer care, and particularly in the area of gynecologic malignancies for a little more than 30 years now. I started out at the, uh, I was on the faculty of the University of California, San Diego, having completed my uh, fellowship training at Johns Hopkins uh, University Medical Center. And uh, after uh, being in, in the University of California system, I joined uh, the faculty at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I was vice chairman of the Department of Medicine. And then I was uh, chairman um, and director of the Cancer Center at the Cleveland Clinic for 12 years. Um, and then prior to my current uh, position, I was the uh, Vice President of Clinical Research at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. So you've seen a lot of different areas. Can you tell us a little bit of difference about where you currently are versus more of an academic uh, 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 facility? Very good question. I've, uh, having been in the, uh, uh, the academic realm for, for 30 years, I, I want to do something different. Um, and uh, I was very intrigued with the um, very pa uh, much patient-focused model, uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, and the integrative oncology model. Um, and uh, I decided that that's what I would do. And uh, I've, I've been delighted. I've been, uh, uh, it's been a great move for me uh, personally and professionally. Uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America has been around for about 30 years. Um, and it uh, prides itself very appropriately on uh, focusing directly uh, on patient needs. And really what that means at the clinical level is you, you, start, you start every question with, is this in the best interest of patients? So we don't ask, um, you know, is this the opportunity to get a grant or is this uh, great for, you know, the educational mission of the organization? Or will this help uh, individuals uh, be able to write um, a wonderful scientific paper? First question, for example, in research is, is this a great study for our patients? And um, you may end up get to the you may end up getting the exact same answer as you would in the academic world, but you start from a sometimes a different position. Um, and uh, I very much uh, like this. And and again, the integrative oncology approach, focusing on um, uh, mind body uh, issues, uh, diet issues, um, you know, focusing on uh, you know what patients think are important. Quite frankly, some of the uh, herbal medications that they've used for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, that the, you might say, the traditional medical establishment just learned about. Uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America has known that patients were interested in this for a long time, and, and, and we really get involved in this both at the clinical and at the research level, and, and I'm very supportive of this approach. In your clinical background, I want to get your take on ODAC's recommendation um, against accelerated approval for a PARC inhibitor um, and the FDA's final decision. Um, well, uh, the drug is known as Erlaparib. Uh, I couldn't possibly disagree more with the uh, determination of the, um, the review committee. I, I, I don't know that the, you know, the FDA, is, as best to my knowledge, has not made a, I mean, we, we don't hear what the FDA says often. Uh, my understanding is they've said, do more research, do more uh, studies. I, I think the, the data on this particular drug is overwhelming. They were, as a randomized phase two study and a lot of data that supported it basically showed that one could almost triple the time to disease progression in a randomized trial um, in, again, a very specific setting with the use of um, this agent versus, um, uh, in this case, it was a, a placebo control. But I think in addition to that, um, 
I have a fundamental uh, disagreement with the approach that um, medical individuals, as um, expert as they may, may be, and of course I would put myself in that category. I've been involved in ovarian cancer research for the last 30 years, I've said, but I would say that these decisions on um, risks versus benefits in the setting of a truly life-threatening situation should be made by the patients and their families. Well, let's talk about another controversy, and that's a controversy around Avastin and the use of ovarian cancer. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting phenomena. Um, um, again, this relates a little bit to the role of the FDA and how the FDA makes certain decisions. Um, it turns out, for uh, a variety of reasons, which time doesn't allow me, allow me to discuss, um, angiogenesis, that's blood vessel formation, new blood vessel formation, is very important in ovarian cancer. And this drug, Avastin or Bevacizumab, is an anti-blood vessel growing, an anti-angiogenic agent. And therefore, it is not surprising that basically every randomized trial that has been looked at in ovarian cancer, advanced ovarian cancer, whether it was initial therapy or second line therapy or therapy in uh, patients who have failed primary, truly failed primary chemotherapy with, with very progressive cancer. Every trial that's looked at bevacizumab has shown an improvement compared to not using the drug. But that improvement has been in delaying the disease progressing, but not in showing an improvement in overall survival. And uh, presumably for the reasons of the regulatory world, um, at least in the case of ovarian cancer, uh, the, the decision has been made to date that in the absence of showing an improvement in overall survival, the drug will not be approved, it has not been approved by the FDA for use in ovarian cancer, even though a number of compendium and certainly organizations have said it, it's perfectly reasonable, in fact, quite appropriate to consider. So um, it, that's a little bit of the controversy. But quite frankly, every trial has shown that if you give bevacizumab with chemotherapy, uh, you do better than chemotherapy alone. And the FDA is set actually to make a decision on this coming up later in November. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's actually, a, this is actually a very important, uh, and very uh, a bright spot, uh, at least as of today, in terms of the, this question. There is one subset of patients. Again, all of these trials that I've talked about have been positive, meaning there's been a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival. All of them have shown that. But and none of them shown an improvement in overall survival. But one particular setting, and that is a, in the setting of a patient with ovarian cancer whose cancer has progressed on the drug platinum, which is the major drug in ovarian cancer, within six months, and that's a, not a good situation. Um, here, the use of bevacizumab plus chemotherapy has shown an improvement in, uh, in progression-free survival. And it is important to note that this is the first trial ever, ever, and I'm talking about 30 or 40 years um, of the treatment of ovarian cancer with platinum that has shown an improvement in this endpoint, progression-free survival. In addition to that, uh, this particular trial showed an improvement in one very important symptom. So not only did it show an improvement in progression-free survival, it showed a reduction in pain in women with ovarian cancer. Well, what is new in cervical cancer and, and, um, and in your research? Well, in cervical cancer, the other, the other uh, new development is uh, Again, the, the use of bevacizumab. Bevacizumab uh, has been shown in combination with chemotherapy to improve, in this case, overall survival in cervix cancer. Uh, the use of bevacizumab in cervix cancer has, was recently approved by the, by the FDA. Um, and oncologists have been using it for, for a while. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, cervix cancer is a very difficult disease, and when you get to the point where you're using chemotherapy um, or um, you know, any other approach that other than the, the, the surgery um, or radiation is difficult, which again, when I say with cervix cancer, the goal with cervix cancer is to prevent it. Any other thoughts that you'd like to add? No, I'm, I'm well, enjoyed speaking with you. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time to talk my, to us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for watching Onc Live News Network. We'll see you next time.